tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to episode 12 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. You know, none of us are getting any younger. Oh, I'm not saying any of you are old, but I do understand a little bit about borrowed time. I mean, I see people my age out there climbing mountains and ziplining, and here I am feeling good about myself because I got my leg through my underwear this morning without losing my balance. I knew it was going to be a good day. It will be a good night as well. It is time for part two of two of Everything Inc. by Jeff Sturdivant. Let's get after it. In the previous episode, Paul and Dan are adjusting to life under the thumb of Everything Inc but things don't seem as simple as they appear. Is this massive social experiment really for the good of everyone? Or is everything ink an assault on the human spirit? Or worse? And now, for your indulgence, part two of Everything Ink, written by Jeff Sturdivant. Chapter 13 The powers that be at Everything Inc. offered a constant flow of opposing force to us workers, like a tolerable storm whose winds never died down. While Dan and I did our best to make our stay as comfortable as possible, there were always new rules, always stricter guidelines, and they never seemed to be for any necessary reason. It was like they only wanted to make it more difficult not to get in trouble. You always had the feeling you were being watched, maybe not literally watched, but monitored somehow. They seemed to know when you were at home, know when you're sleeping, know when you're up. The television would just pop on by itself when there was something they wanted you to see. That's how I learned about the new performance policy amendment one morning. The face on the screen was our benevolent president, Len Carter, smiling that precarious smile of his always seeming to teeter between personalities. Dan had explained to me that the people behind those smiles were always dangerous. Bit like a gator gar, he had said. And if he hadn't told me that, it never would have occurred to me, naive as I was. As employees of Everything Incorporated, you are entitled to be informed of all policy updates. Regarding our performance policy, a few minor updates have been instituted to preserve and maintain the quality of our products and services. To pre-frame these adjustments, I'll restate that at Everything Inc., our model is never ask too much of our employees. All of our jobs are designed to be easily performable by anyone of any age or gender, given proper training. It is our strict policy never to ask too much of our workers and to provide the means and materials to offer a reasonable day's work. If for any reason 
an employee is unable to work with reasonable expectations, adjustments may be made or a transfer to another job may be completed. If you feel that you qualify for an adjustment or transfer, ask your supervisor. Otherwise, an employee chronically unproductive will be administered a series of strikes. Once an employee reaches his or her third strike, he or she will be rejected from his or her position and his or her lodging will then be forfeit. That is all. I knew Dan was probably seeing the same thing next door. I wondered what he thought of it. Vague enough, yet deliberate enough to seem both innocuous and threatening at once, like a tornado watch in an unlikely place. But with the tension at Everything Inc. seeming to stiffen all of a sudden, you got this feeling like there was an axe falling, ever so slowly, over all us slaving losers. Reinforcing the notion was my quiet suspicion that there wasn't quite the number of employees at Everything Inc. as advertised. There just wasn't enough room, and with all the new people constantly coming in, there must be an increasing pressure to get the old ones out. I sounded conspiratorial to myself, but I was also tired of being so naive. It seemed to me that the hurdle for acceptable production was slowly being raised. It would have to be. Chapter 14 How many employees does everything have here? I asked Jack, already knowing what his answer would be. 50,000 on average, he said. I told you that already, said Dan. But did they all live in the hive? Is there any other residential area in Enterprise? Nah, said Ronnie. They're strict about that. They like to know where everyone's at. That's how they keep their thumb on top of you, Jack affirmed. I was thinking about it. There's just no way 50,000 people live in the hive. On average, said Ronnie, people come and go. This ain't for everyone, you know. My building has 4,400 units. If all the buildings are like mine, that's eight buildings with 4,400 units. That's 35,200 maximum. So where are all the rest? Hell. Ronnie said. If I was any good at math, you think I'd be here? Hell yeah, you would, said Jack. I'm just curious, I said. Doesn't make sense. Maybe they have more units in some of the other buildings, Dan said. Ronnie, what building are you in? Four, said Ronnie. All right, I said. So when you go home later, have a look at the chart in the stairwell. You should be able to figure it out. What about that plant? Dan said. Supposed to be exclusive people working the plant. Maybe they live somewhere else. Could be, I said. But not 14,800 of them. I live in building six, said Jack. I'll check my chart too. If it turns out the buildings are the same, Dan went on. You're right, Polly. That's a little strange. Any of them shack up in the same room? asked Jack. No way, said Ronnie. Against the bylaws, one man per room. Don't need any of us working idiots coming up with conspiracies and shaking things up. I got the knock a little later than usual that night. By now, I'd been conditioned to like a lab rat to get my beer on time. Not the healthiest habit, but hey, I breathed plastic fumes all day long. If something was going to do me in, They'd find my lungs turned to Tupperware before they worried about my liver. Classic rationalization, Paul Harper. I got up and unlocked the closet door. Where you been, Dan? Dan had stayed behind after work. I knew he was going to get beer in any case. Still, he usually got back a lot earlier than this. Scribbling a little bit. Writing? He sat down and handed me a beer and opened one himself. He looked like he had had a couple already. This whole place, it's not really the rules themselves that bother me. It's the restrictions you put on yourself to deal with them. You know what I mean? Not really, I said. He sighed, took a drink. You get up and go to work. Work all day, then come home and go to bed. 
It's a mindset you have to put yourself in to live like this. It costs more than just your pride. You gotta give up your aspirations, your expectations, your creativity. Because how could you live with those things? You can't take care of them. You can't feed them. They'd end up dying like neglected pets. I nodded. They kind of own you. Well, I can't do it, doggy. He chugged his whole beer and belched. I remember Debbie telling me I was crazy for writing my stories, and that day I decided she was right. I guess there was no point in writing my stories, fine, but what was the point in anything? Getting up, working, breaking even at best. What's the point? There was no point. I was writing because I like to. Seems like a good enough reason to me. No reason. You know how you're doing what you're supposed to do, Polly? Because you're doing it for no reason. Because there's no point to it. Like breathing. Pretty sure there's a point to breathing, I said. Bad example. You know what I mean. I did. I must have looked confused for a second because I was wondering what exactly it was for me. What did I enjoy? What did I do for no reason? I get it. I said, so you want to read it? Your story? Yeah, absolutely. He set down his beer and went through the closet into his room and came back with a short stack of paper and handed it to me. I took it. At the top of the first page, it said, Flush Tor, the John from space. I'll read it right now if you let me. I got my beer, he said. Have at it. So I read it. It was better than I thought it would be. Sure, it was loaded with puns. I never figured an alien would be such a potty mouth. But just like Dan, it was a good time and funny as hell. I enjoyed it. It wasn't until later that I admitted to myself that I enjoyed it more than most of Moby Dick. And even later that I realized why I'd stopped reading like I used to in the first place. It had been some time during that period between when money meant something and then suddenly didn't. This period of dissipating novelty during which the cement and aggregate of life turns everything concrete. Imagination becomes kid stuff. Years go by. You lose things. You think you're moving forward, but inevitably, you lose more than you gain. I was lying in bed when that thought came to me word by word, like a line of moving prose. My eyes opened wide, staring up at the darkness. Chapter 15 After doing my errands on Saturday, I thought I'd explore Enterprise a little more. On the far side of town, I found an internet cafe, something I'd heard about from the guys on the line. In the outside world, Internet cafes were things of the past, long extinct since the web became so mainstream. But here, without any signals, not everything's own, access to the internet was exclusive and strictly limited. By the time I went in and sat down in front of a computer, I'd forgotten all the things I wanted to look up. What I remembered was that anything I browsed would be tied directly to my account so I'd have to be careful not to type in anything that made me appear suspicious or traitorous. Big Brother was always watching. But what harm was there in being interested in the company I worked for? I typed in Enterprise Power Plant. What I found didn't seem particularly curious or secretive. Enterprise was largely powered by gas, including the electricity, also generated by gas highly advanced technology developed by Everything Energy, an everything company, completely self-sufficient. All I could dig up about the technology was that it had its roots in old landfill methane extraction. Some of this I'd known already. You could see all the garbage trucks in town carrying loads of waste to the plant for composting. Big deal. So what was the trouble with letting people work there? To protect the top secret technology? Just out of curiosity, I typed in methane gas energy technology. 
expecting to see some giant deposit under Nevada, but there wasn't one. Could it be that all the methane came from a landfill? All of Enterprise's garbage? By the time I asked myself that question, I had used 18 credits worth of internet. It wasn't worth it. With the internet so prohibitively expensive, if there was something you needed to research, you'd better know exactly what it is. Surfing just isn't worth the money. On my way back to the hive, the midday blaze was losing its strength. I saw a black man walking east, swinging a plastic bread bag at his side as he went. His clothes said he was homeless. And then I recognized him. It was Dave, the fellow Dan had recognized on the way in. I crossed the street and walked alongside him. Dave? I asked. He looked queerly at me. Do I know you? No, actually I know Dan. Guy who used to work with you stamping product, southern accent. Dan, with the accent, yeah, I remember him. Is he back? Yeah, he's back. We live next to each other. He chuckled. Man, I thought he'd end up on the street with us. He's something, I said. He said you're something too. Yeah, I'm something. You tell him I said he's something else. Want a cup of coffee? He bent an eyebrow at me. You buying? Yeah, I've got a couple credits left. Yo buying? I'm your man, he said. We sat at a bench outside a coffee shop on the corner of the intersection. Make a right and you're headed back to the hive. Left and you're headed towards the outskirts of town, near the gates, back out to the outside world. And the flood channel entrances, if Jack had it right. I heard what happened, I said, with the fines and everything. One fine was enough for me. I barely had enough to get by as it was. Add my lifestyle and, well, I don't know if you've ever had any expensive lifestyle habits, but if you do, you know they take precedence over all that other stuff. Bills, rent, all that. He didn't seem so crazy to me. Not the way Dan had described him. I can't imagine, I said. So the fine was enough to... To put me out on a street. Which was the whole reason I came here. To get off of the street. Well, at least I was used to it. I heard a lot of you guys live down on the flood channels. I squat down there most nights. I'm no channel rat though. I come up during the day. You gotta be careful not to get too comfortable down there. They're wise to it. The law enforcement, they know we're down there. And if you don't know where to hide when they show up, they'll snatch you up and drag you away. And we never see those channel rats again. I was stunned. You mean they go down there and just drag you guys out? They say it's in the interest of public safety that we can't be down there interfering with the utilities and all that. And we never do anything like that. We just need a place to sleep. There are utility tunnels? Go from there, he pointed back towards the opening of the tunnels, all the way out to the power plant. But we ain't messing with no utility workers or no utilities. We just want to live. We don't want any part of that meat grinder you working in. It's not so bad. I said. See, you might not think it is, because you got a little roof over your head and everything brand eggs every morning, but I assure you, it's bad. It's worse than you know, and you're gonna find out. How so? I asked. Every credit they give you, it all goes right back to them. The rent, the food. He holds up his paltry bag of bread. They give you a handful of credits, and you spend it all on their stuff for a profit. What they give you is nothing. What you give them is labor. It's free labor. Know another word for that, Paul? I, uh... Slavery. That's the word you wanted to say. So ask yourself, does this arrangement really feel fair to you? 
having to live under their rules, having to buy all of their goods, just giving back all the credits you earn is a mere formality of the process you're really in? Slavery. I thought about it a moment. It made sense, what he was saying. But still, I was so thankful to have the little roof and the everything brand eggs. Sure, the money they gave me was only a gesture of sorts. They would inevitably get back every credit. But if I had no genuine freedom, I had a pretty good guise of freedom. Enterprise, Dave went on. Gotta be the biggest joke you could call any place like this. It's a slave colony. We built this company, this self-sustaining mega company, from the tireless laboring of good people. But now it's a monster machine that eats its own people. Consumes them. What kind of organization is that? Dave took a deep breath and a long sip of coffee. Well, I don't work for them anymore. But they've still got that pledge I signed. The Pledge of Usefulness. Meaning, I'm still sworn to be as useful as I can to this joint. And one day, they're going to snatch me up and wave that form in my face and say, So, what are we going to do with you now, boy? And they'll drag me out of my tent and down that channel. Down what channel? The tunnels. I've seen it happen. Follow the channel down west far enough, and eventually they're gated up. The channel rats stay away. Don't blame them, because wherever they drug those people off to, they drug them down that way. What's past the gate? I asked. Hell if I know. The channels run under the power plant and out through the west end of town. They're gated over there, too. Again, Dave didn't come across as crazy. Not the way Dan had made him out to be. Eccentric, maybe. A guy who believed the world was after him. This conspiracy about people getting dragged down the channels. I remember Dan telling me about his bad habits. Drugs would do that to you, make you paranoid. Still, I was curious about what he knew. Or at least what he thought he knew. So, when you see Dan, Dave went on, you tell him I'm just fine. And speaking of fine, let him know I never paid a credit of what I owed him. I will, I promised. I stood up and started putting on my coat. Dave got the message and did the same. If I didn't start on my way back soon, I'd be flirting dangerously with the curfew. Thanks for the coffee, Dave said. No problem at all. If you need anything, anything different, he subtly thumbed his nose. Or whatever. That east entrance to the channels? Just come on by and ask around. You'll find me. Chapter 16 Jack and Ronnie reported the next day that their buildings each had 220 units per floor, 20 floors. The same number as my building. It was pretty safe to assume that the other buildings were identical too. And if that was true, the numbers just didn't match up. There simply was not enough room for all the employees there were supposed to be at Everything Inc. Where's Steve been? Asked Ronnie. Steve? I asked. He was here up until last week. Further down the line there. Red hair? Right, I said. I remember him. I wouldn't be surprised if the guy got tossed out, Jack said. He was a snail on the line. He had seemed a little slow, in every sense of the word, really. It was like they made that performance mandate just for him, said Ronnie. Just as soon as it came out, they were all over his ass. Hardly his fault, Dan said. His station's a dog, just like mine. So what do they do? I asked. Move him to another position? No idea, said Ronnie. Never been disciplined. Dan over there will get it next, Jack said. My only holdups when you guys fuck it up, Dan said. He's got a point, I said. Send up that shit that works, Dan said. 
I'll hit that button faster than any of you bums. The guys had a chuckle at that. We all knew it was usually Ronnie's screw-ups that sent the piece back to me. Something about the way he manhandled those pieces together with his big meaty fingers. Gotta treat those pieces gently, Ronnie, Dan said. Like a lady. Jack snorted. Ronnie hasn't touched a lady since... I don't know. Doubt he ever has. Treat her like your pita then, Dan said. That's no better. He'll squeeze it to death. When I get my hands on you guys, I'll squeeze you to death, said Ronnie, grinning. Dan didn't take the blunders personally, of course, but his performance did suffer for them. Whether or not it was his fault, if his light didn't light up, he ended up taking the biggest hit for it. That's just the way it was with the structure of the line. And it turned out we had jinxed him by bringing it up. That same night, back in my room, Dan told me he had gotten a talking to from Oris. I can't believe it, doggy. The guy actually pulled me in the office and accused me of holding up the line. He popped a beer and handed it to me. Did you tell him why? I asked. Of course I did. But the guy's all numbers, doesn't listen to reason. It was the silliest conversation I think I ever had, and I've had some silly conversations. He cracked a beer for himself. What did he say when you told him? Said to hurry it up, so I said fine, I would. Maybe I'll just send some duds down the line, let the dude who replaced Steve deal with him. Then he'll end up getting pulled in the office next. Yeah, I know it. Nah, I wouldn't do that to him. He took a long swig. Hey, on a lighter note, I've got this new story I'm working on. Everything went as usual for another couple weeks. Dan told his jokes, the guys and I broke some balls, and we all got our jobs done. Dan was spending a lot more time in his room writing, but we still got together at least four times a week, and when we did, he was like a whole new guy. Always oh, babbling on about his new story he was into, trying to give me the gist of it without spoiling it. He seemed happier these days, and for the right reason I knew. For no reason. He was doing what he was supposed to do. But was I? One night after Dan left, I got undressed and got into bed and just lay there awake for a while, staring at the shadows of the suicide bars in the window. I wondered what it was that I was supposed to do. I really had left it all behind when I came here. The good and the bad. The precious and the broken. I had come here an empty vessel. At least with nothing to do, there was no way to fail. As long as I could go on inserting the three-pronged plug in the three-hole thing, I was a certified success. A genuine item on the world's dollar menu, right, Paul Harper? but what right did I really have to feel sorry for myself? Everyone here, at least everyone I knew, had also lost their families one way or another. Take Dan. His wife Debbie had gone in search of greener pastures herself. The grass is always greener, right, Dan? Maybe I had less to do with my own failure than I gave myself credit for. Failure seemed to hover out there in the free world almost like a cloud waiting to burst at any moment. When Amy and I both were ready to admit the truth, that I'd never be able to take care of her or the kids like Dr. Thurmond could, I didn't have the strength to mount a resistance. The rainfall was inevitable. It wasn't about me. I'd been the sacrificial lamb since the beginning without even knowing it. How selfish it would have been to stand in between her and the life she deserved between Amy and the kids and Dr. Thurman. I'll never forgive myself for my speechlessness when Thurman took me out for lunch and explained to me how I wasn't the protagonist of my own story, not the way we all believe we are in the novelty of our youths. I wasn't even a side character. I was the antagonist, the bad guy holding everyone back, causing all the problems. So what could I do but step aside? It was my final undoing, the most complete failure of all, and the perfect ending to the story. 
the antagonist is undone in the end by his own fatal flaw. That's exactly what happened, just as it had since the dawn of storytelling. It could hardly be considered a tragedy. Not by him, at least. Probably not by the kids, either. But that moment, Thurman signed the check and asked me if I had a couple bucks for a tip. As I reached in my pocket and dropped my last eight dollars on the table, drained of all dignity, unable to utter a word of protest, I became fully a trophy of failure to myself that can never be redeemed. It was always after Dan stumbled back to his bedroom that I'd take out the trophy to polish with self-pity. So I was a sucker. Fine. At least I was an award-winning sucker. Chapter 17 The guys and I got to talking a little about Old Vegas, various details they had heard and read about over the years. Jack happened to know a little about those underground channels where some of the homeless supposedly lived. So, they built these giant flood channels in the 1980s, he said. Even then, people ended up living down there. Hundreds, I heard. Lost all their money at the tables and ended up with no place to go. There's gotta be plenty of them down there now. There's sure a lot more people that got kicked out than you see on the street. You ever been down there? I asked. I've seen where they get in, Jack said. Over by where the depot meets the highway there, off to the right by the scarp there, kind of cut out from the hillside. That's where they get in. Goes all the way under the old strip, across town, right down under where the plant is. When the hell does it flood around here? Ronnie said. The raindrops turn to steam when they land. Oh, it does. Not often, but the ground's too stiff to soak it all up, so when it decides to, it'll flood you right under. Who'd a thunk it? said Dan. So what happens to the people down there if the channels flood? I asked. Shoot if I know, Jack said. They learn to swim in a hurry. Screw that, said Ronnie. But the rent is free, and I hear it's a whole lot cooler in the summer. Tell you what, if they kick me out of here, that's probably where you'll find me next. Beats getting hassled by the street cops. He snapped his tape and hit done. Hundreds, huh? Dan said. That was back in Vegas days. There's got to be a thousand now. How would you know? Said Ronnie. There's just got to be. How many guys you seen kicked out of here already? Good amount. There you go. Wouldn't you rather leave? I asked. I mean, if you lost your job at everything, I'd rather give it another go than go live underground. That's pride talking, said Jack. You know what they say, pride goes before a great fall. Dan chuckled. A cliché goes before a great barf. There were plenty of peculiarities about the city to talk about, some likely bullshit, but others pretty well-established facts. No one seemed to think the discrepancy between the supposed amount of employees and the amount of apartments in the hive was as strange as I did, however. I'd bring up the oddity from time to time, but it earned mostly disinterested shrugs. From the very beginning, since I'd seen that winding line of people waiting in front of admittance, it had seemed amazing to me that a place could take all these people in, day after day, day and night. Maybe it was my own self-loathing, the fact that I felt so good for nothing in the first place that surprised me to see so many people being given a second chance like I had. Tough as it was, it was a real, viable second chance. If so many of them were leaving Enterprise, where were they going? What were they doing? Following their dreams? I remember my dreams when I was young, the days of novelty before the whole enchilada fell apart. I'd always let my imagination get the best of me. They actually encouraged that kind of thing when I was a kid back when they lectured you about things like maximizing your potential, back when they still used phrases like the American dream. I dreamed of being rich, not rich in the way you'd think, but rich on a kid level. 
I could have gotten away with 40, 50 grand a year. That was rich. I'd have my own little place, eat TV dinners, watch TV, drink beer, and enjoy myself without worrying about paying the bills. How hard could that be? Getting to this level of richness seemed a perfectly attainable goal. It was attainable. Only just as soon as I got there, it no longer seemed so dreamy. Neither did the shitty little apartment with the shitty little TV. It seemed like the minute I cashed my first fully vested check, Amy showed up in her little shorts and halter top. I never asked for her, never looked for her, never yearned for that kind of life, to be honest. I'm just a solitary type of guy, which is why I never would have expected kids to join the mix. But yeah, they showed up too. I loved them all. Just never expected that kind of thing to happen to me, especially without asking for it in the first place. Never expected to be counted on, leaned upon so heavily, fed upon until there was nothing left for them to do but move on to a different host. What do you guys think about fate? I asked. The three of them looked at me like I had spontaneously grown a mustache. Huh? Asked Jack. The things that happen to you in life, are they always your fault or could it be all your destiny? We were all silent for a moment. You've been smoking pot, said Jack. Chapter 18 At home, it was time for a double cheese craft dinner. My latest poor man's pleasure. A box of pasta and a stick of butter later, I sat in my swivel chair like a wet bag of flour, flipping through a good chapter of Moby Dick. By dark, I realized I hadn't heard from Dan yet. I opened the closet and knocked at the wall. Dark behind the curtain. When he didn't answer, I knocked again. I pulled the curtain aside. His closet door was closed. I checked my watch. It was past curfew now and no sign of him. I sat back in my chair no longer in the mood to read. What the hell was he up to? I wasn't worried about him getting caught out there. Dan knew what he was doing, but it was unlike him not to be back by now. Plus, I was a little disappointed that I had to wait for my beer. Damn it, Dan. You've made a lab rat out of me. I watched TV and waited for him a while, but it seemed like Dan was having himself one hell of a night somewhere else. My eyelids were growing heavy. I swung my feet up on the bed and lay back. It was time to turn in. Man, whatever Dan is up to, he's going to be a bag of shit at work tomorrow. But Dan wasn't around in the morning either. I knocked for him, but his door was still locked. Had he come home at all? I thought maybe he was up and having breakfast without me. But when I got down to the cafeteria, he wasn't there either. Normally, I'd have grabbed something to eat but I didn't have much of an appetite. Something was wrong. Where the hell was my friend? When I got to work, Dan wasn't there either. My stomach sank when I saw the empty spot across the line. You guys seen Dan? I asked. Jack and Ronnie both shook their heads. Looks like the party boy's a little shagged out today. They pay attention to that shit, you know. Callouts. They count them. Too many call-outs, and they'll put you on the chopping block, Ronnie said. He didn't call out. He wasn't in his room to begin with. Wasn't in his room? Asked Jack. Where'd he go? I shook my head. Thought he might be out doing something last night, but he never came back. Jack and Ronnie looked dumbly at each other. Crazy asshole, Jack said. Maybe he's been hanging out with old Dave. Chapter 19 I hurried home after work. He'd be there when I got back, I told myself. I was worried for nothing. Dan's a grown man, a crafty one at that. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to get around. He knows how to handle himself. I was just being stupid, I told myself. But I wasn't sure. Another part of me knew how Dan was, that he'd let me know if he was going to pull a stunt like that. Wouldn't he? Maybe not. Maybe I was overreacting. 
Maybe he'd think I was ridiculous for being so overly concerned. What was I supposed to be anyway, his babysitter? But still, I wasn't sure. My stomach was tight as I went upstairs and made my way to my room. I thought about knocking on Dan's front door, but decided it wasn't worth it to make the racket. I unlocked my door and went inside. Dark from between the slats of Dan's closet door. The knob on the inside would open the door even if it was locked, which I was sure it was. I stood looking at the doorknob, dreading what I'd find on the other side. I took a deep breath and turned it. Dan's room was exactly as it was the last time I'd seen it, including his suitcase, which sat open on his floor, still with most of his clothes. My stomach sank like a bag of sand. Dan was gone, but his stuff was still here. It was worse than I'd thought. What had happened to him? If he had been fired, he would have come back to get his stuff, wouldn't he? Maybe not. Maybe he was so upset with everything, he had decided to make a completely fresh start. Maybe he hadn't the heart to tell me he was leaving. Maybe he had been embarrassed. Maybe that's all it was. Then I saw the go bag. No, I thought. There was no way. I picked up the bag. It was unzipped and neatly inserted inside was the paper clipped manuscript he had been working on. Flush tore on top. There was a chance he'd leave his ratty clothes behind. There was also a chance, although I wouldn't expect it of him, that he'd leave town in shame without telling anyone. Maybe. And there was only an infinitesimal chance, but maybe he'd even leave his go bag behind. But leave his manuscript? Never. Not a chance in hell. Whatever had happened to Dan, it was clearly worse than I'd thought. My face flushed with pressure. I picked up Dan's go bag and took it back to my room and slammed the closet door. I didn't care how much noise it made. Damn it, Dan, what the hell did you get yourself into? I huffed for a minute, then sat back down on the bed. Had they grabbed him at night? Had it been like he had said? Had he become a liability? Were the guards he bribed into him for too much? Had they somehow made him disappear? Had he run for his life? Had he ended up underground? In the channels? Or underground? I took out the manuscript and sat on the little bed with the stack of papers in my lap. Now and then, a ghostly feeling, like I was holding a dead man's hand. They couldn't really have... Could they? Chapter 20 You know you've seen your best years when your own life has entered its final act. The climax of my own story was the wife and kids leaving. Boring and melodramatic, I know, but not everyone's life is a fast-paced thriller. There's a reason we read stories, you know, because life is essentially boring. It's exciting to join Captain Ahab on the Pequod. It's exciting to become little Stevie for a while, gleaning secret knowledge from a talking toilet bowl. That kind of stuff doesn't happen every day. Even considering the bleakness in which I ran off to Enterprise, there was a spark of excitement in starting over again. Starting from a diminished level, but a new level nonetheless. I allowed this feeling that I was back at step one, but with a much sturdier place to push off. That there was nowhere to go now, but up. It was only rationalization. The idea behind Enterprise, behind everything Inc., wasn't to be a more forgiving ledge on the climb to success, but a safe ledge to keep you where you were. Try climbing and you'll slide safely back down the wall, like the sand on an overflowing sandcastle. Make a few bucks and they'll get taxed right out of your pocket. Get up on your feet and they'll knock you back down. It's just the way it was. It was the only way a place like this could work. So what was the end game? I found myself asking, laying there on my undersized bed, just too small to get comfortable. The gray bar shadows stretched long over the stiff bed sheets, like three damning slashes through the early morning sunlight. What was the end game? When did it end? How did it end? Death, that's how. 
All paths pointed to the same end. I'd always pictured success as a kind of routine. Work, come home, loosen the tie, hang up the hat. It seems like a good idea when you picture it, but when you're there, it's different. When you're truly stuck on a ledge, no matter how wide, how comfortable, you can suddenly understand why people behave so strangely. The chances they take, the addiction to conflict, the tendency to make bad decisions, if only for the sake of making a decision. Why they move all the time, sell their houses and buy new ones, leave their hometowns only to come back eventually, leave steady good jobs for lower paying more interesting ones, leave stable relationships, vote in crazy presidents, buy convertibles, do drugs, all these things. Because whether up or down, people want to move. They want change, good or bad. They need to succeed or fail. Whichever one may not matter as much as I thought. They're two sides of the same coin. It's idleness that's the problem. Idleness is like floating comfortably into oblivion. And we're all floating into oblivion. All paths point there. But I'm human, like everyone else. I'm supposed to be doing it kicking and screaming. I'll get there regardless, same as everyone else will. But I'm not supposed to do it like this. The end game isn't what's important. It's the game that's important. And maybe the game wasn't over. Maybe the climax hadn't really happened yet. The familiar sound of boots came clumping down the hall. Several sets of boots. They came to a slow, then stop. Right before my door. By Dan's door. I don't know why it hadn't occurred to me until that very moment. Maybe because I'd been emotional about Dan. Maybe because I'd been so deep in consideration. But it struck me like a lightning bolt. If Dan was truly gone, they'd eventually need to enter his room. And when they looked into the closet, they'd see the door Dan had cut there. And they'd know I was involved. Whatever had happened to Dan, whatever they had done to him, they'd probably do to me too. I sat up sharply in bed, listening carefully. The second my fears were confirmed, the very moment I heard the key enter Dan's doorknob, I was up and grabbing for my own doorknob. I had to get out of there, fast. But as I was standing there waiting for the boots to clump their way into Dan's apartment, I remembered the go bag and tiptoed back to get it. And as I heard the door close behind the officers, I opened my own door and turned, headed left, down the long hall. Remembering the fire escape map, I took the stairwell furthest from the entrance, and with the go bag slung over my shoulder, I walked hurriedly down the steps until I got to the ground floor. Too jolted with adrenaline to worry about it, I shouldered my way out of the emergency exit, setting off the fire alarm in the process. I didn't look back. Chapter 21 The streets of Enterprise were busy with employees on their way to work. Trying to appear inconspicuous, I blended in, keeping my eyes forward, Dan's go bag at my side like a lunch bucket. Nothing unusual here, folks. Only I wasn't on my way to work. I knew the minute I punched in, I'd be a sitting duck. My heart still pounding from the hasty escape, my mind still swimming. I knew I had a decision to make. What next? No time to think about what I was walking away from. Not now. All I needed to think about was my next move. I broke off from the westward crowd and headed east, out of the residential district. I fell in behind a group headed toward Enterprise Station. We passed by the same street corners and vendors I saw that night Dan and I took the bus to admittance. I remembered seeing Dave that night wondering how the hell he ended up homeless in Enterprise, wondering how a guy could blow his second chance like that. Yet here I was. It had always been in the back of my mind, the fact that I ran like a coward. There was no hiding from it after the lights went off. It wasn't the world that chased me out. It was me who ducked and ran. And here I was, hightailing it out of here the same way I came the same way I ran out of California. I tried to shake it out of my mind. My next move, that was all I needed to know. What was done was done. I needed to get out of here. 
I unzipped Dan's go bag and rifled through some of the compartments. I needed money for the train. If I used my account, they'd surely send out an alert for me. His lock gun, multi-tools, survival stuff. I stuck my fingers in a small zipped pouch and found what was certainly a tube of rolled up bills. Bingo. Guiltily, I put them in my pocket and zipped up the bag. It was as though Dan were still looking after me, even after what they had done to him. The idea of pocketing the bills left me slightly nauseated. Following the crowd on the way to Enterprise Station, the thoughts snuck back into my mind. The waste it had been to come here. I had gotten a second chance, and I'd blown it. I'd earned a friend, and I'd lost it. Yet another idle month in my life with nothing to show for it in the end. The idea that ultimately, I had lost. My stomach soured. My legs began to go weary. There was no putting it out of my mind. It was all coming to a head. I came here a failure. I was leaving a greater failure. I was finished. Truly now. Finished. At the corner of Enterprise Station and Everything Boulevard, I paused. Everyone as they were, walking along, minding their own business. Lost in their little lives. The futility of it all hung on my shoulders like a lead vest. I was paralyzed. The thoughts bounced off the walls of my skull like a bullet to scramble my brain. People walking unto their deaths. A man in his bodega, leaning on the heel of his hand. A bird pecking at a bit of garbage, flying away, apropos of nothing. Like everything there was, apropos of nothing. The thought arrived like an electric shock and left just as quickly. There was nothing left to live for. The novelty had drained completely. A quiet courtroom battle was taking place in my mind as I stood there at the corner people filing by, moving around me like river water around a stone. I'd lost everything, the precious and the broken alike. There was no reason to lift a finger, no reason to breathe, let alone move forward, if not to restore an atom of dignity to the empty husk of Paul Harper. I'd been broken to begin with. How many lumps could a man take? The weariness turned to a flash of anger as I found my motivation. I wasn't going to run away from this place. Not just yet. Not before I got a little of what I wanted. Chapter 22 I found the mouth of the channels right where Jack had placed them, dug out of a dry dune down from the east gate, where old Dave told me I could find him if I needed anything interesting. But drugs weren't what I was after. I wasn't sure exactly what I was after, but whatever it was, I was chasing after it. Twenty yards past the graffiti-lined entrance, I walked down the concrete tube in near-total darkness, food wrappers and paper bags crunching underfoot. A subtly dank subterranean breeze brought the temperature down a few degrees as I went deeper down the tube. I thought I made out some chatter a ways down, maybe picked up a hint of smoke too. I saw a smattering of light on a shiny curve in the tunnel wall further down the tube. Around the corner, the tunnel opened up into a spacious chamber, lit dimly by floodlights. Twenty or thirty people threw out tables around the perimeter with their vendors displaying their wares. Customers examining the items closely in the dimness, others clustered by the several tunnel entrances, talking, sharing bottles. Unseen cigarettes pulsing red in the dark an underground flea market of sorts. I caught a couple of weird looks as I walked into the room. I scanned the room, but it was difficult to see in the dark. I approached the closest table, manned by a bundled up vendor whom I couldn't imagine showing himself up on the surface. A channel rat, I thought. I'm looking for Dave, do you know him? I know plenty of Daves, he said. Black guy, don't know his last name. Heard him called Old Dave a few times. He nodded. Old Black Dave, yeah, I know where he is. How much money you got? For what? You want Old Dave? I know where he is. I'll show you the way, but it'll cost you. It was more of the last thing I needed. 
Indignity. Fuck off, I said. Whoa, take it easy, the vendor said. Times are tough. Can't blame a guy for trying. The vendor had his own share of defeats, I imagined. I took a breath. He told me to come looking for him here. Never told me anything about a toll collector. It's all right, this one's on me. Take the tube on the left there. He pointed to a corner in the room where a group of undergrounders cavorted around a large opening. Head down a ways. Just give him a shout around the encampment down there. He'll hear you. I fished a five out of Dan's emergency money and held it out to him. He snatched it away quickly. Thank you, he said. Down the leftward tunnel, I came across another chamber. This one clearly designated as an encampment for the channel rats. Groups of homemade hovels built from shipping pallets, tarps, and cardboard boxes. Smoky coils hung cloudily in the yellowed floodlights. I asked a lady smoking a cigarette nearby if she knew where Dave was, and she pointed me to his house. Dave's eyes lit with recognition. My man. He held out a hand and we shook. In the mood for a little excitement? I am, but it's not what you think. Oh, no? What you told me up there about them dragging people away? Tell me more. He looked queerly at me a moment. What happened, my man? Dan is missing. He just disappeared. Dave shook his head. You're thinking they had something to do with it? He just vanished, left all his stuff behind. He could have just split. Wouldn't be the first time. He never would have done it without telling me, and he never would have left this behind. I patted the go-bag at my side. Trust me, I said before he could object. There's something in here he would have never left behind. What is it? A manuscript. A manu what? A book he's writing. Dave chuckled. He told me once he wanted to write a book. I was like, what's the point? Look, I said. Was it really true what you said about them kidnapping people, dragging them down the channel? I told you it was true, didn't I? And everyone else tells me you're crazy. Yeah? And what do you think? It was hard to get a read on Dave's face in the dark, but I thought he was getting slightly annoyed. He didn't sound that way to me, I said. Dave lit a cigarette. So you want to see for yourself, he said. I have to. And y'all think I'm crazy. Dave took me to the mouth of a wider tunnel. A ways down was the locked gate. Beyond was the run under the secretive power plant. Neither he nor any of the channel rats went anywhere near there. Trouble was the last thing they wanted, and meddling with Enterprise was nothing but trouble. Besides, it was locked up. There was no way to get by the gate anyway. He reminded me that I was the crazy one, and he left me there at the tributary. I had second thoughts, but I reminded myself why I was here. On principle. The point? There was no point. I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, chasing whatever it was I was supposed to be chasing. I was just doing it. And I walked. And walked. The wall of the pitch dark channel my only guide for what seemed like miles in the dark. Until faint gray lights produced the gate up ahead. There it was, the gate Dave had told me about. I hurried toward it, my feet smacking in the shiny film of water now on the floor of the tunnel. Black jailhouse bars. I shook at them briefly. Of course, they didn't move a millimeter. So secure, they begged curiosity. Feeling around, I found no keyhole, no obvious lock mechanism. Even if there was, Dan's lock gun would be no match for it with its dainty picks and pins. I stood back, the dim light beyond casting long black shadows at my feet. On the wall a ways back were the rusted remains of a rebar ladder. With Dan's bag slung over my shoulder, I climbed my way up the gritty rungs until I reached a dark recess in the ceiling topped by a manhole cover. Quiet above. No way it opened up onto the street. I climbed until my shoulder pressed against the iron and pushed, unseating the heavy cover and sliding it to the side. With another effort, the hole was wide open. I climbed up into cool darkness. 
Chapter 23 I emerged into the corner of a dim control room, unmanned at the moment. Two computer consoles at the far end, before dark glass panes, like the cockpit of a large airplane. Red lights blinking back against the windows, dark beyond. The woodwind hum of industrial ventilation. The kind of place where you immediately knew you weren't supposed to be. A prickle crawled up the back of my neck. There was a microphone for an intercom system, and the thought of calling out for Dan crossed my mind. But I knew it was useless. I pushed the feeling back into that grim corner of my mind, the place where I'd set aside the truth for the moment. What I was after now was answers. I wanted to know just what it was that we lowly workers weren't good enough to know. We suckers, locked up in our rooms like children at night and expected to behave. But the time for behavior was over. I sat at the console and squinted at the glass. Mostly dark on the other side, all I could make out was an immense shapeless form in a huge chamber, wound with tubes running up to the ceiling high overhead. I tapped away at the keyboards and threw a few switches on the switchboard, but to no effect. Just the droning machinery and the blinking of the powered down consoles. I pointed the flashlight around the room. There was a door to the left of the consoles, which must lead into the chamber. I knew I didn't belong in there, and that was enough. The door was locked, but there was a keyhole override, and it looked pretty basic. I retrieved the lock gun from Dan's bag and inserted it and started pulling the trigger. After a few snaps, I heard the lock release. Success. That's when I noticed the sign on the wall nearby. Danger. Gas mask required beyond this point. Of course, danger was exactly what I was after at this point. Beyond was a short chamber and another door. Secure airlock before proceeding, the door said, but I already had the gun in the lock. In a few snaps, that lock gave way too, and I opened the door onto a hyperbaric rush of strange air. Automatically, dim lights illuminated the chamber. And there I stood, at the top of a set of tinny stairs, looking out on a steaming pyramid of rippling waves of mirrored air, like the midday desert asphalt, rode upward along the mass. Moving down, steadily decomposing, an intubated mountain of meat. Knotted arms and legs, clawed fingers, loose bodies at the summit, wormy rot underneath, gone to slime by the brow, by the bottom, gone to dirt. A flash of understanding. The gas. The plant. The technology I'd read about on the internet. The people. My legs went weak. Pressurized gas sucked from within the intubated mountain of gore. The mulching bodies, fermenting gas, churning the machinery that fed Enterprise, fed the streetlights, the machinery, ran the television back in my room. This place, it feeds on its own people. What the hell have we done? I went down. Chapter 24 Again, doggy, so I couldn't get the message to you. There just wasn't any time. Dan tested the light and hit done. He'd had no trouble making his numbers since Ronnie and I had switched stations. Ron's fat fingers were fine at plugging the connectors together, and my dainty little ones were much more adept at his old job. And I'm sorry about Debbie, I said. Don't worry about me. It is what it is, he said. But I still wish I could have let you know. Was she your only family? asked Jack. She was it, Dan said. If you could still call her family, we'd been separated ten years. Still, said Ronnie, it's a bummer when it's someone you know. There were only a few ways they'd let you cross back over and return without repeating the admittance process. One of them was the imminent death of a family member. Since Dan and Debbie had never legally divorced, the situation qualified. Sure, said Dan, but it wasn't all bad. It was good we got to talk a little. The way things ended, you know. Some loose ends. 
thought your ass had been fired, said Jack. Dan grinned to himself. You guys should have seen the Paul machine, he said. Breathed in so much gas, he thought he had seen Jesus. I saw a lot more than that, I said. I sure had. The last thing I remembered was my ass hitting the floor. I was lucky it was my ass and not my head. I was even luckier Dan had found me when he had. A few more minutes of methane and we wouldn't be having this conversation. Man, Dan went on, I never figured you for such a go-getter. Neither did I, I said. Or a sucker, Jack said, listening to old Dave. The guy's been sniffing glue since he was 11. I shrugged. Ought to go down anyway, Ronnie asked Dan, after we talked. Dan hit the done button and sent another piece down the line. Soon as I saw my gold bag was gone, it was like I saw things through Paulie's eyeballs. I mean, if I were him, I'd probably think I was in trouble, dead even. And I had a feeling he'd be peeking around the channels. So when crazy old Dave pointed me down the tube, I had a pretty good idea where I'd find him. Of course, Dave had laid all his conspiracy stuff on him by now, and with me missing and everything, shit, I'd have believed it myself. So when I saw the light coming down from the manhole, I knew I was on the right track. Man, the both of you boneheads could have gotten caught, said Ronnie. If Paulie was going to get caught, so was I, Dan said. So I went up after him, followed the Paul sign, he chuckled. Wet footprints, due west, signs everywhere, ventilation equipment required, gas masks hanging on the walls, so I grabbed one and put it on. And thank God I did. You know who didn't? He helped, I said. Found him lying flat on his back in the compost theater. It's where all the methane gets made. Basically a planet-sized mountain of fermenting garbage where they extract all the gas. And Polly hid breathed enough of it to kill a dinosaur. He was hallucinating. You're lucky he came after you, Jack said. I'm a lucky guy sometimes, I said, much luckier than I thought. So I drag him out, continued Dan, and this brick's heavier than he looks. I gave Dan a jab in the arm. Ooh, brick's got an arm on him too. Forgot you were next to me now. That'll learn you, Ronnie said, and now Paul gets to deal with your farts. I've had enough gas for a while, I said. Yeah, Dan said. I'll spare you as long as I can. So I burned a sick day chasing down Dan, or him chasing me more like it, but it could have been a whole lot worse. It was bad enough Dan's wife had died, but he had nearly lost a roommate too. Funny how things turn out sometimes. The grass is always greener. You've heard it a thousand times, and you end up realizing things weren't as bad as you thought. Take Dan, for example. He's always trying to make the best of things. That day we got back to the hive, he told me about his wife and what had happened. It was bad, but it wasn't all bad. Lying there in her deathbed, Debbie had had plenty of time to reflect on the way things had gone between her and Dan. To wonder, without all the petty, day-to-day -day concerns that normally cloud our thoughts and drown out those deeper questions that come in the quiet and the night. Like, what's it all for? And... Why bother? And why do I do these things that I do? And why am I not happy? I don't know how much of that she figured out herself, but she did realize one thing. She told him she felt bad for discouraging him from writing his stories. That it wasn't because there was no point in doing it, she realized. It was because it made him happy, and she resented it. No money, no future prospects, and there was Dan, tapping away somehow happy. His only bad habit. They call it the creative man's burden. But that's no way to look at things, doggy. We all should have such burdens. As long as you're willing to shoulder it, you've got a reason to keep going. And keeping going was what it was all about. Not about making all the right decisions. Not about winning or failing. It was only about going. About playing the game. Maybe getting one over once in a while while you're at it. 
there's a way to do your unsavories after all. But in the meantime, the important thing was not being idle. Humans are comfort-seeking creatures, I've always heard. And sure, that's what we tend to do. But it's the worst thing for us after all, isn't it? There's a reason they say not to put a couch in the same room with a treadmill. You'll always choose the couch over the discomfort of exercise. Same as you'll choose the comfort of idleness over the insecurity of the ruthless world. It's comfort we're all ultimately looking for, but I don't think we're ever supposed to get it. Comfort dangles just beyond the void. All roads lead to it, whatever route you're taking. It's why we quit our jobs, sell our homes, ruin our relationships. It's the very reason why we flail the way we do. We refuse to be idle because we're searching for comfort. It's our nature. It's our engine. It would be more reasonable to take what pittance of comfort the world offered you and ride your years out safely. But that's just not the way we do things. There's no reason to do the things the way we do things. And that's exactly how we know we're supposed to do them that way. Let's make a stop real quick, Dan said. It had been a week since the incident, and Dan had managed to switch out his pen and paper for a cheap keyboard and printer he had ordered from Amenities. I had heard him through the wall these nights, tapping away, printing pages. He had bound up a few prints of his short stories into little paperbacks. For homemade books, they looked pretty good, too. He pulled one out of his jacket pocket as we walked into the little bookstore. There was the usual crowd in there five or six bookworms, and the two of us. Dan headed to the S section and tucked a book into the shelf next to Dan Simmons's Hyperion. Wrote free on the back, he said. The price is right. That's what it cost me to write it. Only a matter of time before they get rid of this place, I said. This little drug den. I mean, look at these guys. I gestured to the few readers dipping in their toes taking indulgent little peeks. Strange worlds printed and pressed into these innocuous little bricks waiting to be unfolded. Whether you made them yourself or read them, you were in constant flux between dimensions. The grass isn't much greener in any of them, really. It's greener when you're making the most of what you've got, when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. But seriously, who gives a shit about grass? So you're really leaving, huh? Dan said. Yeah, I said. Papers are in. It's official. You sure about this, doggy? I'm not sure about anything. I just know I gotta move. I understand. Not saying I won't be back either, I said. But either way, nothing lost. You lose your favorite drinking, buddy, he said. Yeah, I will lose that. At least for now. You couldn't dig up a turnip out there, Polly. Not sure a turnip's what I'm looking for. Just want to dig. Dig for what? What are you after? Don't know. Only know I have to chase it. Dan's heavy arm fell over my shoulder. Let's go drink some beers, he said. Epilogue Dave was shaken awake by another caravan coursing down the channel. Most nights he'd sleep through it. But lately, sleep was uneasy. The drugs didn't help. They seemed to bite back in the middle of the night these days. He'd wake with those ephemeral thoughts still drifting through his mind. The ones he tried washing away with booze and drugs in the first place. What was the end game? What was he doing here? And what was really going on at the end of the tunnel? Sleep wouldn't come again. With an inspired anger, he started walking, following the slow-moving carts at a distance. What was he afraid of anyway? Dan had gone. He'd seen the two men walking back out of the channel the other day. Maybe Dan was right. Maybe Dave was wrong. Maybe he was crazy, seeing things. So he walked. He sneaked close to the last cart as it went through the open gate and around the right side of the caravan as the man went back to secure the lock after they had passed. An uneasiness settled in his stomach as he heard the click of the lock but no one had noticed him. The procession continued. Further down the tube, he returned to the rear of the cars and followed. 
There were ladders leading up to manholes above, but he hadn't come this far to break off yet. He wanted to see where these cars were going. He was through speculating. A while later, the cars were slowing down. The dim red lights had brightened a bit, and the whirring of machinery had gotten louder as they went. When the cars finally stopped, he went around the right side of the caravan and into the dark by the far walls of the channel, behind a row of intermittent support columns. He crept from column to column, careful to stay ducked below the dim marker lights from the ceiling. More of the square cars up ahead. Many, many more of them. He tiptoed away from the columns and out to a railing looking out over a long low depression. The cars, dipping down one by one, rolling out to a deep, intubated pit. One of the trailers tilting backwards on hydraulic pistons like the bed of an enormous dump truck. Outrolled bodies, limply tumbling into the pit. The faint smell reached him now. The sour waft of death escaping from the powerful vacuum system. Hey, you there! Dave turned to see two gas-masked men closing in on him. He wouldn't have had much longer anyway, he figured, not with all the drugs he was doing. And what would he have done anyway? Tell everybody? He'd been telling them for years. They all thought he was crazy. As the gun barrel raised toward his face, he noticed dimly a poster of President Len Carter hanging benevolently on the far wall of the tunnel. He remembered the paper he had signed, certifying that he pledged to be an asset to enterprise above all else. The contract of usefulness, was that it? Close enough. I hope you enjoyed Everything Inc. Part 2 of 2, written by author Jeff Sturdivant. Jeff Sturdivant is a winner of the 2018 ABR Listener's Choice Award for Best Humor Entry for his audiobook production of Occupational Hazards, The Blue Collar Omnibus. He writes about the absurd, the macabre, and general strangeness of the human experience. When he isn't writing, he drives a brown truck and delivers packages. When he isn't doing that, he's usually narrating audiobooks or getting into trouble. If you see him, avoid him, but do buy his books because they are really quite good. For more information about Jeff and his books and to pick up a copy of them today, visit his website at flexfiction.com. That's F-L-E-X-F-I-C-T-I-O-N dot com. You won't be sorry you did. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at 
fear from the heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.